everyone, and welcome to this episode of Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan, and today I am talking to Laura Kiesel. Laura is a resident here in Arlington for nearly 10 years now and an in independent advocate and journalist. Uh, and one of her focuses of concentration for sure uh, is the area of housing. And uh, Laura, first of all, let me thank you for being here. We appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Great, and uh, we do wanna talk about housing, the, the issues around housing and affordable housing in particular, uh, generally, but we wanna concentrate mostly uh, on how things are playing out here in Arlington. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you are, uh, it's a funny word to use, I was gonna say, you're in the privileged position uh, in, in a sense. Uh, you're in the uh, special position, I would say, to speak to this of somebody who is uh, a, a, in, in an affordable housing situation yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I live um, at Capital Square Apartments, which is um, one of the main properties for the Housing Corporation of Arlington. And I've lived here for um, going on seven years next month. Okay, and so I think before we got uh, came on air, you and I were talking about the fact that it is rare indeed uh, for uh, warrant articles, such as the two that you are part of uh, the sponsorship team for, um, and that we will discuss uh, in further detail as our conversation moves forward. But for warrant articles around affordable housing to be written by somebody who's actually in your situation is a rare thing. I think you haven't heard of anybody doing this yeah. yet, right? Yeah, I think this is the only warrant, um, or two, we have two warrants that is um, authored by renters, entirely by renters. And I think it's the only one, and I think it's the only one we've had at all that has been authored in part by an affordable housing tenant. So I'm gonna ask you to kind of set the parameters of the conversation for us here by just uh, you know leaning on your expertise in this area and having you talk about what the situation is with affordable housing uh, in this area, you know, mm -hmm. in the Boston area, and then kind of start to zero in on what the story is here in Arlington. So the Boston metro area, it is one of the most expensive rental markets in the country. I believe it may be at this point, it's been uh, vacillating back and forth between the third most expensive and the fifth most expensive. I think as of a year or two ago, it was the third most expensive rental market in, in the country. Um, so, and there's also other parts of Boston Metro that are particularly notorious. Um, it, in 2017, I believe it was, there was a study by Rent Cafe that found that the Boston Metro area was the single most expensive and um, cost prohibitive rec rental market for single, so unmarried women um, due to a combination of the cost and uh, a wage gap issue being larger here than the other major cities. And we have one of the largest, I think it might be the largest wealth, racial wealth gaps in the country. There was a really explosive report that came, I think it was from the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston in uh, four or five years ago that showed that the median net wealth for black and African-American households was $8. And so not 8,000 or 800, but $8, whereas the median wealth for white households was basically almost a quarter of a million dollars, so $248,000. Um, so we have a lot of disparities by, um, by race and gender too that really exacerbate the housing problems here. Yeah, and as you said, it, it is, I think everybody is aware uh, mm -hmm. of a couple of basic kind of facts or premises that we can proceed forward on. And one of those is, yes, this is an mm -hmm. incredibly expensive place to rent mm -hmm. or try mm -hmm. and own a home. Um, and then Arlington itself uh, mm -hmm. is, you, you know, introduce us to what the situation is here in Arlington. Clearly it mirrors, uh, it mirrors the situation in greater Boston area to a, a large degree. Yeah, so the Arlington is reflective of, to an extent, the problems with the larger metro area, but in some ways, and this is why we felt the need to do these two specific warrant articles, Arlington is behind a lot of our municipal neighbors in affordable housing. So the state mandate um, is that 
each municipality should strive to have at least 10% of their housing stock be affordable housing. And Arlington is barely over half of that threshold. We're at 5.7%. And we're behind all of the municipalities we, we border with the exception of Winchester, as well as a lot of other ones that um, kind of compete with us with um, population and, and demographics. So uh, even though we can say, well, you know, it's a problem with the whole state or the whole city, like we, we can't just fall back on that. We have more responsibilities to, we, we need accountability to do more for affordable housing because even by the standards of the Boston metro area, we're, we're falling behind and we're not doing enough to provide uh, genuine affordable housing for those those who need it. And um, I was surprised by this because I knew it was 5.7%. But when we were doing our um, research to compile an FAQ, I was surprised that in the past almost 20 years, so 18 years, we've only increased our affordable housing stock by 0.1%. So it's only gone up from 5.6 to 5.7 since between 2001 and 2018. Um, and I think we really need to to catch up and do, do a lot better than that. Yeah, I, I have to say, I'm glad that you brought that last uh, statistic up because I was going to, if you didn't, uh, in that I was struck, really, really struck by that um, in, the, in some of the materials you shared with me uh, before, uh, before our chat today, uh, to see that, and especially mm -hmm. that compared to uh, the surrounding communities, which you said already, we are lagging here in Arlington, but the degree to which we're lagging, when you compare that 0.1% to those figures that you had cited from other communities, Cambridge at 14%, Belmont even, <laughs> I shouldn't say even, but Belmont at 6.5%, et cetera, and, and other surrounding communities also really, mm, for want of a better term, I'll just say it, kind of putting us to shame here um, yeah. in, the, in that sense, um, especially because, I'm sure it's not that Arlington was that much closer uh, to affordable housing uh, goals and aspirations uh, beforehand. That clearly is not the case. Yeah. Uh, so there is work to be done in town. And I mm -hmm. do know from speaking to residents and to town officials over a number of years now that this rhetorically, at the very least, this seems to be a very high priority for a lot of people here in town. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, about what to do about it then. Mm -hmm. Assuming people recognize there's a problem, people want to find a solution. Uh, how do the warrant articles that you are uh, that you are sponsoring or co-sponsoring with with others? Uh, how are they meant to address uh, that issue in a concrete way? Yeah, so um, the first warrant article, which we just had our hearing last week with the redevelopment board, uh, they vote April 5th. Uh, it would basically increase the inclusionary zoning requirements for private developments. Right now, the inclusionary zoning is that one out of six new units or 15% in private developments have to be quote unquote affordable. Um, and uh, we originally proposed it as a range between one out of four or a quarter or one out of three and 33%, but because we felt that maybe a third might, um, well, one, hit a lot of resistance, but two, maybe it might not be as feasible because of a lot of issues with economics, we settled for um, one out of a quarter. So if this passed, it would be that new developments, um, one out of every four units have to be affordable. Now, um, well, I think the minimum uh, buildings right now, as it's written, would still start at six build six units or more. So in other words, as it gets bigger, but we're actually thinking, or I know some other citizens have talked about adding an addendum um, or a friendly amendment, I think it's called, to make it start at one out of, at, at four units. So if someone has a four unit building that they built, that one of those units has to be affordable. And I actually, um, I got the spreadsheet from Aaron's work of, I think, um, you know, different buildings from the past 15 years, different developments. And I think several, there were several four building um, developments where I was thinking, wow, 
you know, if we had higher inclusionary zoning, you know, one of the each of those several buildings would have been affordable. Um, because I know some people have concerns that with one out of six, well, we're not, we're just not getting enough affordable stock in. Um, and also that, you know, it's easier to evade if people want to do just four, if, uh, you know, a developer builds a four or five unit, then there's no affordable housing in, in those units. And at the same time, the market rate, when you're just building, um, you know, new high-end developments, a lot of times that just escalates the rent prices in the area. If there's no affordable housing to kind of offset mm -hmm. those costs and stabilize it, so um, I think one way to do it is to increase the affordable housing um, minimums that we need for this town. And I know that that was something that was actually recommended. Uh, I think it was in 2016 with the housing production plan was one way to start actually increasing the affordable housing would be to increase our um, inclusionary zoning um, amendments, but it hasn't nope. been done yet. Yeah, so I uh, just uh, just to be crystal clear because you just gave a lot of information. Yeah. The the what you are seeking is to ensure that we that we have zoning such that any developer or anybody who's going to be making a uh, uh, building that has six units or more for now um, mm -hmm. that a quarter of those 25% rather than the current 15% or a sixth of them would have to be again, affordable housing. Yes. Okay. And then the hope, as you mentioned, uh, for, on the behalf of some other citizens, um, is, is to actually lower that threshold from a six unit building to a four unit building, uh, which yeah. again would, would kind of include or, or, uh, encompass a wider, uh, a wider array of potential new buildings. Yeah. yeah, I think as we have it written now, it will still be an improvement since a lot of buildings are a lot more than four or six. But I, I think if that threshold gets lower, it will be more meaningful for if and when there are, there are more of those four building, uh, four unit buildings. Mm -hmm. And did you, uh, does it make sense uh, to you right now to mention the other uh, warrant article as well? Or should we? Uh, um, you know, table that for a little bit. I, I mean, I can mention it really quickly. I, the, the thing, the other part of this is that a lot of times even affordable housing isn't very affordable to low income people. I was proud that Arlington uh, at the end of fall for fall town meeting passed an affordable housing trust fund. Um, and I think that that also, because some of the arguments or pushback I've gotten about increasing the inclusionary zoning is that it's a disincentive for developers because it's, a, it's expensive to create affordable housing and they're not recouping their costs. But there've been a lot of changes better in federal policy with the low income housing tax credit, as well as statewide to increase the value of those credits quite a bit. And also I think we're doing things locally here to help fund more affordable housing. And one of those things is the trust fund. However, I was disheartened that, um, I think it was at the 11th hour and there were two competing amendments. One would have earmarked the funds of this trust fund to go toward households making 60% or lower area median income, which is what actually HCA's um, standard is 60% AMI or lower. Um, and then there was another one that would allow households making up to 100% area median income um, to qualify for these funds. And the 100% AMI got passed. Uh, I'm concerned about that. So to put that in real numbers, 100% area median income, um, I think that is 80, I think that's $86,000, um, $85,000, $86,000 for a single family household. Uh, for a two family household, that is $93,000. And for once you start getting into three family household, that's like $107,000. Um, so you're basically allowing these funds, people who are middle, cl middle class or even upper middle class or borderline upper middle class to qualify for these funds. And my Laura, concern- Laura, let me, sorry, sure. don't, don't, sorry to interrupt. You were yeah. saying one family and two family and three family. Do you mean like one- person household yes. or yeah so it's if you're a single family household just you a single person you're not married no dependents no children 
Um, it's, I think it's 85 or $86,000. Um, my notes are in here, but I, that mm -hmm. it's around there. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know for a two family household. So either if you're a married couple or you're a single parent with a child, um, it's $93,000. And then when you start getting into a three family household, so say a married couple with a child, it's $107,000. Um, those are the, the incomes of that right. level. And to just plainly say what my concern is. So I talked about the median uh, wealth gap uh, between black and white households. The area median income in the Boston area for black and African-American households is $47,000. The area median income for Hispanic households, I think it's $42,000. The area median income for white households is um, $86,000. So about um, or $85,000, so about the same that this level is. And whether intending to or not, this becomes a proxy of, of discrimination. It can exclude Black and Hispanic households from here. Um, and I know that we've had a lot of talks in this town, discussions about how single family zoning has been a proxy, even if it was not um, it didn't name it as such, but it was a proxy to exclude Black and Latinx households. There's been a lot of discussion um, in housing justice circles here in the Boston metro area, primarily led by people of color about how these very high area median income um, determinants for affordable housing has become another proxy to exclude black and brown people uh, from neighborhoods. So whether it was intending to or not, my concern is that very high AMI is exclusionary uh, to people of color and also that's very high. Uh, people who are on Section 8 vouchers, I'm on a Section 8 voucher. Um, and again, Section 8 vouchers are disproportionately um, held by people with disabilities. Um, and again, black and brown people or seniors. Th this is too high for people with vouchers to use to access affordable housing in towns like Arlington. And right. so I wanted to... Sorry, Go on. just to, to, again, just, just for in the interest of, of keeping things as crystal clear as possible, um, Section 8 vouchers are for a certain amount of money. And yeah. clearly, if an affordable housing unit in one town versus another is a lot more expensive, that, that doesn't, those, those vouchers don't increase. Um, yeah. It's just that you have to supply the difference between the voucher and the rental. Um, and that, and that's, a, that's obviously a big problem with higher rents. Um, yes. And there have been studies that show a lot of Section 8 voucher holders, particularly Section 8 voucher holders of color, are being hyper concentrated in extreme poverty neighborhoods and aren't having access to higher income neighborhoods like Arlington. So our um, our warrant in that respect is seeking to earmark the majority of those funds. We have a proposed range 75 to 85 percent for people making at or under 60 percent AMI. Uh, just to try to ensure that most people who are the most needy um, can actually have funds through that, that affordable housing trust fund. You know, I, I know that some concern was, well, what for home buying programs, you might want to hire a a a AMI. So that's why I think this is a compromise. So let's have a little bit put aside for the higher incomes for, you know, home buying opportunities or whatever. But I really, I would like to see the bulk of those funds go where I think they were initially intended to go, and especially during the COVID pandemic, where um, people are being pushed out into the streets or in congregate settings like shelters and institutions where because of the virus, that is could be a death sentence and it has been a death sentence for many people. So can I um, just ask you about about this, because I'm sure folks are, 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 you know, generally following what we're saying, but um, is the is is the warrant article then seeking to set as a uh, as a stipulation that whatever the range is that you've determined seventy five let's say seventy five to eighty five percent of the funds in the in the affordable housing fund would go to people whose AMI or um, just a median or area median income is 60% or less. So as yes. you said, those truly in need compared to those from the 60 to 100% above. Um, and so is that, would that be a stipulation? Would that be a, a guide? Would that be guidance for them? 
what what is it that the Warren article is seeking? So you know how sometimes with Warrens they can solidify before town meeting. So we haven't had our hearing with the select board yet ah, to course. get their input. I mean, I hope for a stipulation, it might be a guidance. It's a little bit of an experiment. When I spoke to Doug Heim and I asked about doing this, he said, you know, we That's passed- town lawyer, by the way, yep. Got yeah, it. town council. So, mm -hmm. you know, he mentioned that since this has passed, but we haven't established all the parameters yet. It's a little experimental to be trying to do this and do an, a range. Um, but we could try, so we're trying. And at the very least, we're hoping to direct a lot of attention and a conversation for how these AMIs can be exclusionary. But at the most, we are hoping for either stipul a stipulation or a guidance about where the priority of these funds and the bulk of these funds should go. Okay, that's great. Um, thank you for uh, yeah. you know, kind of setting these things up um, as, as clearly as you have, because uh, in a lot of ways, these things are complicated and they uh, involve various calculations and various acronyms, which yes. again are always uh, difficult to sift through a lot of the time for, for people, even, if, even with the best of intentions. And speaking of the best of intentions, um, I wanted to ask you about the fact that here in Arlington, I think um, many of us, most of us feel that way about ourselves, that we have the best of intentions in terms of uh, our black and brown neighbors, in terms of uh, our seniors, in terms of uh, people with disabilities, in terms of, uh, you know, Section 8 and affordable housing. Um, I do honestly think, I don't think that, that, that people are deluding themselves necessarily, but I do believe that that's part of, our, our, of the way that we see ourselves. I, I think we also wanna see that reflected in town officials, those making, putting policy into place and making decisions that affect all of us. Um, I think you have a couple of good points about, uh, to make about the fact that good intentions uh, might be genuine and still, mm -hmm lead to some, uh, you know, um, unintended and unwanted consequences. So speak to that, please. Yeah, I mean, so I'm a disability advocate, I'm a disabled person. And I, I mentioned this, so I held, held a housing equity panel uh, last month. And I mentioned that we have this saying that I, I really like try to abide by it's called nothing about us without us. Because Again, no matter how well intentioned, if anyone who's working on a policy or program, if they are not getting significant input um, from the actual populations that are most impacted, there's going to be blind spots. And whether, again, whether they're well intentioned, they're gonna miss stuff and it's going to make the policy to some extent inequitable. So it's always important to really try to talk to the people most impacted and, and listen and take, um, take credence from what they're what they're asking for and implement that the and I, I so that's what I, I why I also wanted to, to design this warrant in mind with my own experiences about AMI so I live in the housing corporation of Arlington and when and a few years ago I was I first I, I started out in market rate housing here in Arlington and I was within two years priced out. It was going up hundreds of dollars in a couple of years. And I at the 11th hour, I got into HCA housing, um, which I was, you know, happy to stay in Arlington. I wanted to stay here. But then um, I had health issues and my due to, to those health issues, I had to scale back my work significantly. And so over an eight month period, my income was halved. But um, a luxury condo went in next door, the Mass Ave project happened, and my rent started going up higher than my income. Um, and very fortunate for me, I had savings, a lot of people don't, that I could skim, but it still was not going to be sustainable long term. I eventually was going to run out of savings if something didn't change. But what surprised me is when I spoke to town officials, when I spoke to people on HCA's own board and I explained that I was being priced out, several people were very surprised. They thought that because I lived in affordable housing, my rent was in, you know, capped at a certain percentage of my rent so that I could not be priced out. And I was like, no, that's not how it works. You know, if you have a voucher, you know, the voucher will absorb up to a certain, you know, they pay three quarters of your rent and you pay up to a third of your income, but I'm not, I wasn't on a voucher at the time. And I was like, so there is no cap. And since the AMI um, is set at a rate uh, equivalent to what the area is, if the area gets very expensive, then even the AMI, you know, 60% AMI can be a lot. 
Um, so people were, didn't know that. And, you know, I, I'm on Medicaid because of my disability. And just to also put it in context, you know, a lot of low income people are on Medicaid. When I spoke to a caseworker at Medicaid and I told them what my rent was at the time, she paused and said, wait, I thought you lived in affordable housing. And I said, yeah, no, I, I do. And she's like, well, that that's affordable housing nowadays. That's how much it costs. And I was like, yeah, that's how much it costs in the Boston metro area and in Arlington. So I think a lot of people just think, oh, affordable housing, you know, people, you just go in and you're not paying much. And so right. affordable think, housing, people can afford it. <laughs> yes. And so I think that that sometimes I've talked to people in the redevelopment board, a lot of people don't understand these factors and if they're creating policies um i'm worried that some of the effects again whether intended or not is going to be that it's not going to be as genuinely affordable as they think it's going to be or protective of the lower income populations that need it makes a lot of sense um I appreciate very much uh, you being here today and I want, we're running out of time, but I wanted to uh, invite you with the two or three minutes we have left. Uh, if there is anything of import that we have not failed, that we have not yet mentioned and you'd like to, I invite you to do so. Well, I mean, to elaborate again, um, the, so people on disability, I wanted to mention too, um, people on social security income only make seven or eight hundred dollars a month and that's it and again a lot of people who don't understand disability don't know that like for instance people told me why don't you go on SSI um, and I was like because my rent is literally hundreds of dollars more than what the payment is for SSI and people don't understand that so if you're on so social security income you cannot find a single housing market like market rate apartment that you can afford on an SSI check. It has to be affordable housing. And even then you usually need a voucher in addition to that. So especially since we have COVID, COVID has created an additional population of disabled people who can't work and now might temporarily or maybe permanently need to be on disability. Um, so there's gonna be people who need, who need that housing. Um, so I want people to understand that. I think also there's a lot of misunderstanding. I, I know that it wasn't, uh, meant to be a harmful statement, but the redevelopment board made a comment um, in response to affordable housing a few weeks back saying, well, we should also look at workforce housing. And the way it was presented seemed to suggest that it was mutually exclusive, that people don't who are in affordable housing don't work. Many of us do. Um, I think uh, studies show that 40% of people who live in affordable housing work, um, who are working age especially my next door neighbor is a healthcare worker. She's a medical assistant who works for a private doctor practice right here in Arlington. Uh, we have landscapers, we have daycare workers who work for people here in Arlington. Um, so I think I want people to know that a lot of us work. Those of us who don't work due to disability or age still have a right to, to housing here. And we still also contribute a lot economically to our towns. And that's another thing too. I think there was a comment made about growing our economy or contributing toward progress, um, saying why we should invest more in market rate versus affordable housing. And that suggests too that, you know, sometimes people who live in affordable housing are drains on the economy. And there've been studies that show that people who, who live in affordable housing, they're more housing stable than other renters. Um, so compared to homeowners in the rental market, affordable housing people actually stay in their communities longer than market rate renters. Um, and we're more likely to be investing our dollars in the immediate community because we're not going to, to Europe, we're not going to California, we're spending all our recreational dollars here. So I also think the town um, needs to also consider us an asset and I think that will be more reflective than in the policies and willingness to invest in increases in affordable housing to understand that it does pay off in many ways. All right. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank time, you for your activism, for your, your advocacy, your energy, um, and um, and for shedding light on on issues that are of real importance and often misunderstood uh, in the ways that you've described here in town. Um, I have been speaking with Laura Kiesel, um, who is, as you can tell. Uh, an ardent um, advocate uh, for affordable housing, for those with disabilities, for our brown and black neighbors, 
uh, and, and others. Um, and it's been a, a, a really worthwhile conversation. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Um, I am James Milan, and this is Talk of the Town. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.